come to this. So Kai, as I'm showing this, some of the slides, perfect timing, 7.30. Um, if you wanna introduce uh, Christian and I'm gonna be putting his slides with his qualifications as we go along. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this uh, today's speaker is gonna be one of our esteemed residents. Um, he's our current PUI3, Christian Ravindran. Um, you can see he's very internationally um, experienced. He did his undergrad at the University of Toronto, did his medical school at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, he also spent time in Rochester, um, and he is um, currently our PGY3. You can see he has numerous awards, numerous publications, um, and he'll be talking about his vascular uh, interests. And you can see his age index already 13. So, and this is important for our faculty also to see that. Our, this is a new generation. They are already having an impact on the literature very early on. Uh, and uh, so we're very, very blessed. So without any further, I'm gonna stop the presentation right here, Krishna, and you can take it away. Can you see my slides, sir? Yes, we can see them now. Maybe put them in, 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 uh, in presentation mode. Mm -hmm. There you go, perfect. So this talk pertains to some of the research I was undertaking whilst a research fellow with Dr. Chris Ogilvie at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, as well as under Dr. David Kalmas and Dr. Walid Brzezinski at Mayor Rochester. And I wanted to discuss um, the problem of cerebral aneurysm persistence following flow diverted therapy. No disclosures. This is a short overview of the talk. I wanted to give a brief overview of the mechanism of action of flow diverting stents, the various roles that endothelialization across the stent has to play, and then begin to discuss the prevalence of aneurysm, incomplete aneurysm occlusion, as well as certain predictors of aneurysm persistence following therapy. And finally, discuss potential management strategies, either endovascularly or open. Flow diverters have drastically changed the landscape of therapy for treatment of select wide neck aneurysms. The pipeline embolization device was first approved by the FDA in 2011 for giant wide neck aneurysms of the cavernous segment of the ICA. And the indications have now expanded by the FDA. And currently, we are using these flow diverters and several so-called off-label usages, including in the context of ruptured aneurysms for fusiform aneurysms, for aneurysms of the poster circulation, as well as for distal anterior circulation aneurysms. And in contrast to the prior devices in place, namely coils in particular, as well as stents, these devices are, are endoluminal as opposed to endosaccular. And importantly, play an important role by reconstructing the parent vessel upon which they're laid. And now that we've been in the flow diverter era for approximately the past decade, we can see the benefit for select aneurysms again with high angiographic occlusion rates that we're observing. These are some of the devices currently in place in the States. The two predominant devices that are used are the pipeline embolization device by Medtronic and the Surpass device by uh, Stryker. The two underscored devices here, the pipeline shield and surface and evolve relate to second, so-called second generation device devices that um, incorporate a thrombogenic, thrombogenic layer, coated layer, so as to minimize thrombembolic complications. The bottom devices are predominantly used elsewhere in Europe and Australia such as the FRED, SILK, so Tubridge, and P64 flow diverting devices. And the bottom right shows a cartoon of the pipeline embolization device in this case as it's deployed. So you can see the device here amongst the parent vessel, and you can see the aneurysm neck here in the dome there. These devices are incorporate two predominant mechanisms for aiding in aneurysm occlusion. Intraaneurysmal thrombosis, one, and two, provision of a scaffold for endothelialization. This uh, article you see on the right, superbly written article, if I do say so myself, on the mechanism of action and biology of uh, treatment of these aneurysms by flow diverter therapy outlines some of the mechanisms involved. Unlike endosacular coils, which predominantly 
involve intraaneurysm thrombosis as their primary means of aneurysm exclusion, flow diverters importantly serve as a scaffold along which endothelial, cell, endothelial cells grow along the device struts and over time allow aneurysms to occlude. This diagram here just shows some of the events, a cascade of events that lead to aneurysm exclusion following placement of flow diverting stents. And two predominant components in this include reduction in the mean velocity of peak systolic blood flowing into the aneurysm, as you see at the top here, as well as a reduction in wall shear stress. The reduction in wall shear stress, which occurs as a function of reduced blood traversing along the parent vessel, both serves to activate the endothelium, endothelium at the parent vessel and upregulate certain vasoactive cytokines, which I'll detail shortly, as well as to also reduce the actual velocity of blood going into the aneurysm dome and thereby, thereby promote thrombosis formation. Intraaneurysmal flow velocity reduction is a function of two variables, device porosity, which is the ratio of metal coverage and pore density. These are, this is a table from uh, the paper I mentioned before, and it shows the porosity of certain devices that we use currently. So the surpass is actually a high porosity device and compared to the pipeline embolization device with typically a 64 braid as comp compared to the 48 braid pipeline embolization device. Several studies have used bioengineering models, namely computational fluid dynamic models that have provide great, provided great insight into the underlying flow related phenomena that occur that promote aneurysm occlusion when flow diverting stents are deployed. And there's two principal components that we come to understand uh, allow intraaneurysmal thrombosis to occur. And one of them is the role of inflow at the ostium. So these are three-dimensional models using computational fluid dynamic analyses, and the red zone indicates the role of osteum inflow. And the overall goal of flow diverting stem placement is to reduce the systolic inflow area. That is, in, during, during systole, the amount of blood over the cross-sectional area at the aneurysm neck that's traversing in from the parent vessel inside the aneurysm dome, so as to promote intraaneurysmal thrombosis. However, though intraaneurysmal thrombosis via actual circumventing of flow is important, arguably the predominant mechanism by which flow diverting stents allow for aneurysm occlusion is endothelial endothelialization across the device stent. And endothelialization occurs via two predominant functions, two predominant variables involved. Arguably, one of the more important variables here is wall apposition. And this is a function of technical delivery of the device predominantly, where contact between the device strut and the intim of the parent vessel serves as that scaffold across which new intimal growth of endothelial cells can occur. The metal coverage ratio is a function of porosity as well, but predominantly wall apposition allows endothelial cells to grow from the parent vessel forward. And some of the work I was doing when I was in Boston with Dr. Chris Ogilvie was looking at whether these endothelial cells are arising from the parent vessel itself, i.e. locally through paracrine signaling, or from bone marrow release from circulating endothelial progenitor cells. This cartoon is from that previous paper, and it shows some of the mechanistic details involved in the underlying biology of endothelialization following flow diverter placement. And so you can see the flow diverter placed here in the parent vessel, and you can see certain signaling molecules that are involved. So the predominant signaling cascade or um, intracellular signaling pathway involved at the parent vessel is the angiopoietin type 2 signaling cascade, whereby local parent vessel endothelium, in con when contacted by the device strut, starts to upregulate intracellular expression and allows ang the angiopoietin 1 and type 2 cascade in conjunction with the matrix metalloproteinase 9. Importantly, we know from animal models of flow diverter replacement that, in fact, the smooth muscle cell, smooth muscle cell scaffold, excuse me, is equally important to allow these endothelial cells to grow on. 
what you see here floating in the parent vessel are endothelial progenitor cells. So these are CD31 positive and CD34 positive cells that are honed from the bone marrow in response to vessel injury at the local site of delivery. And these are chemo attracted via the CXCR4 um, molecule. Aneurysm occlusion rates following flow diverter therapy uh, have been shown in several large scale multi center pooled analyses to approach just under 90%. The, this is a paper by Dr. Kalmish, which was a pooled analysis of the three predominant pipeline studies in the mid 2010s Intraped, PUFS, and Aspire, two of those being prospective international multi institutional studies. And in analysis of over 1,200 aneurysms at one year angiographic follow up, the complete occlusion rate was 86%. However, this means that approximately 15% of aneurysms were not completely occluded at one year follow up. The PUFFS trial, the Pipeline for Failed Aneurysms trial, um, originally published in 2012 detailed its five-year angiographic results in this 2017 neurosurgery paper. And in the PUFFS trial at five years, you can see complete occlusion occurred in, in fact, 91% of aneurysms. Um, what's notable here is that at 180 days in the PUFFS trial, um, seven, only 76% of aneurysms were occluded. However, at three years, we can see in the subset of aneurysms here that they looked at this another approximately 10 aneurysms then progressed from incomplete occlusion to complete occlusion over that two-year interim follow-up period. So why do aneurysms fail following placement of, why does aneurysm occlusion fail following flow diverter placement? Um, there's been a few postulated mechanisms. This paper from Dr. Shapiro at NYU and Dr. Nelson details some of these mechanisms. And in their analysis, of 100 aneurysms, they were able to identify three predominant mechanisms relating to the prior mechanisms that I discussed earlier. The first was inadequate aneurysm coverage by the device. This relates to metal coverage, that is the type of device used, firstly, and secondly, wall apposition. So that is technical success or failure in deployment of the device. The second extremely important mechanism by which aneurysms failed to occlude was the pres presence of a side branch vessel, such as could be seen in ophthalmic segment ICA aneurysms where the ophthalmic artery may arise from the aneurysm itself. The third predominant mechanism relates to a failure or incompleteness of endothelialization as a process, whereby an endoleak phenomenon is seen, and although partial endothelial coverage is seen on angiogram, there remains a degree of flow at systole that allows blood flow to persist within the aneurysm dome and thereby precludes aneurysm thrombosis. Endoleak may also be a function of inadequate wall apposition as wall apposition strongly promotes endothelialization. Computational fluid dynamic studies have also allowed us to gain insight into some of the engineering variables, some of the flow related variables that may predict whether an aneurysm will occlude following placement of a flow diver and extent. This is a study from Dr. Sabral. Dr. Sabral is one of Dr. David Kalmas's collaborators. He's a biomechanical engineer at in, uh, George Mason University in Virginia. He does a lot of the CFD analyses that have allowed us to look at the flow related dynamics at the local parent vessel when these flow diver and extents are placed. And what we know from both animal models and in vivo angiographic data is that the post-treatment reduction in velocity is critical to promote complete occlusion of aneurysms. And what we still have yet to find is the actual threshold of flow reduction, i.e. when a flow diver and extent is placed, what level of flow reduction is needed to promote intraaneurysmal thrombosis and thereby complete aneurysm occlusion. In this study of 23 aneurysms, what they found at three months at least was that um, in the 10 aneurysms that went on to completely occlude, markedly lower post-treatment intraaneurysmal flow velocities were 
were noted. This is uh, again data from Dr. Sebral's group that looks at uh, a rabbit elastase model. This is the most commonly used in vivo model of uh, flow diverting stent therapy. This is the model I was using in some of the studies I was doing with Dr. Kalmas at Mayo as well as with Dr. Ogilvy in Boston. Um, and what we know is that, again, post treatment aneurysmal flow velocity reduction is predictive of aneurysm occlusion. In this case, they were able to use. Um, absolute reduction in aneurysmal velocity as a dichotomous variable as opposed to a continuous variable with relatively acceptable sensitivities and specificities, high 70s or 80%, as you see here. And what you see here in these three dimensional figures are so the left is an aneurysm. This is again in the rabbit elastase model where they're placing the stent in the anominate in this case. And what you can see here is an aneurysm that completely occluded at follow-up angiogram on the right column, on the left column, excuse me. And on the right panel, you see an aneurysm that had persistence and incomplete aneurysm occlusion. And what's importantly noted here is the inflow at the ostium. So this is really confirm confirming what was seen in some of the um, in vitro models in computational fluid dynamic analyses and really recapitulating this in their in vivo model. One of the interesting findings that was detailed before my time by Dr. Chris Ogilvie in Boston was this concept of a collar sign. So this is a unique observation that Dr. Ogilvie noticed on some of the follow-up angiograms he had been doing on these patients, and he published this. And what it relates to is this presence of a white line, which represents non-opacified blood. So contrast that's in fact not protruding from not traversing, excuse me, from the parent vessel into the aneurysm dome. And as you can see here by this white arrow, what we believe it to represent is incomplete endothelialization at the aneurysm neck. And so there's, this is a, in this top panel, this is an aneurysm that's treated at six month FOB DSA. Uh, again, an ophthalmic segment aneurysm with the artery emanating from the dome there. And what you see is persistence of the aneurysm with persistent contrasts extruding into the aneurysm dome. However, there is this white line of unopacified blood there, which suggests that though there's partial endothelialization, the process along the device struts is not complete. And so persistent channels exist that allow contrast to go into the aneurysm dome. At the bottom, you see two series of follow-ups. So um, panel U represents the six-month angiographic follow-up for this aneurysm, where you can see a uh, faint, what's called collar sign there. And at 12-month follow-up from there, so at 18-month follow-up, you see, again, persistence of aneurysm filming and an enlargement of the collar sign at the neck. What we have noticed recently is that there are several common variables that result in persistence of cerebral aneurysms after flow diverter therapy. And this table that I've included here has compiled a list of some of the studies that have looked specifically at predictors of aneurysm persistence. Some of the common variables, importantly, are age. So age greater than 60 or 65 years is an important predictor for incomplete aneurysm conclusion at one year angiographic follow-up. Secondly, like I mentioned earlier in the previous slides, presence of a branching artery from the aneurysm dome is perhaps the most powerful predictor for aneurysm persistence. Um, like we saw here, see, like we saw here in this example of the ophthalmic segment ICA aneurysm. Interestingly, um, two studies, both uh, Adib et al, as well as um, Dr. Bender's study from Hopkins. Um, excuse me, Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Dow's study have found that actually not being a smoker is predictive for aneurysm occlusion, it, aneurysm in occlusion, excuse me, in that smoking is protective. Um, we're not sure exactly why this may be the case. Um, Dr. Hanel's follow up study of the premier data at one year angiographic follow up also demonstrated that non smoker status was predictive of aneurysm persistence at one year angiographic follow-up. The mechanisms underlying this remain unknown, but this was a phenomenon that we were trying to study in Boston when I was there with Dr. Ogilvie. 
And as of now, we're still not sure exactly why this phenomenon occurs. As we know, smoking is a very powerful um, demographic variable for aneurysm formation due to reactive oxygen species release. This is a summary side of some of the mechanisms that we believe underpin failure or persistence of aneurysm filling after flow diverted therapy. And again, the predominant mechanisms relate to endothelialization. So decreased wall apposition due to technical delivery. Um, parent vessel curvature, again, relating to alterations in the osteum inflow a larger aneurysmal maximal diameter. So this relates to the peak systolic flow area. So if you're increasing the denominator of that equation, then your peak systolic flow area actually increases. And so you're less likely to thrombose within the aneurysm. And then um, size of the parent vessel and the resistance to the flow. So this again relates to the anatomic location of the vessel at which the flow diverter is placed. The role of the branch vessel is important and it relates to the concept of flow demand. Um, it means that blood is essentially siphoned off by the branch vessel. And so because of that siphoning of blood, um, there's persistence of flow. And so there's less propensity for an aneurysm to occlude. And so not enough blood is staising within the aneurysm sac for thrombosis to occur. What Dr. Hanel's recent study has shown is that in fact, um, the rate of aneurysm occlusion, of aneurysm in occlusion, excuse me, actually differs based on the location of the aneurysm. So, in fact, the occlusion may be higher for ophthalmic segment ICA aneurysms, approximately 72%, as opposed to being much lower for PCOMs and being extremely low for anterior choroidal segment involvement, 63 and 20%, respectively. What I wanted to show now is a couple of illustrative cases um, just to show the thinking and the decision making involved. This case is a recent case we did a couple of weeks, a follow up angiogram on a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Fox. It's a 56 year old lady with this bilobe six millimeter right ophthalmic segment ICA aneurysm, as you can see here on uh, oblique lateral and 3D projections. Um, wide neck, this lady in fact also had multiple aneurysms. You can see the pecan infundibulum there. You can see a cavernous ICA aneurysm. And you can see essentially dysplasia and dysmorphic, and a dysmorphic segment of this entire cavernous ICA segment. The decision was made to treat this lady with um, flow diversion. Um, the intraoperative um, procedure was complicated and technically difficult, but two flow diverters were placed, a 4.5 by 16 pipeline, as well as a 4.5 by 17 surpass along the segment here, as you can partially see on the unsubtracted view, and the patient was placed on dual antiplatelet therapy. Six month follow-up, the cavernous ICA, PCOM, and superior hypothesial aneurysms were noted to be obliterated. However, persistence of filling was noted at the ophthalmic segment ICA aneurysm, and notably mention was scene of this collar sign on angiogram. So you can see here this white line separating the parent vessel from the aneurysm dome. And in the follow-up angiogram, we actually ended up doing a vaso CT reconstruction. And so this allows us to give better de delineation of the parent vessel dynamics and better visualized stent. So this is the parent ICA there. And you can see a small, this, and this is the aneurysm dome with the ophthalmic artery emanating from the dome there. You can see a small jet of blood going right into the aneurysm dome at that device interface right there. And so the decision becomes, what should we do for these kind of cases? And so one option was to place a third flow diverter. Second option was to go ahead and clip this aneurysm. And we, in this case, decided to proceed in conjunction with discussion with the, pa with the patient to proceed with the conservative option of the first, which was to follow up this patient closely with the repeat angiogram in six months to stop her second antiplatelet agent and continue her on aspirin 81. A couple of papers recently have outlined um, possible endovascular therapies that can be used in cases where 
uh, cases such as these where aneurysms persist after flow diverted therapy. And this paper actually very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, showed relatively acceptable rates of retreatment with a second flow diverted, in this case, for aneurysms that had persistence after one year angiographic follow up, in this case. And in this case, they were able to achieve 46% complete occlusion when the second flow diverter was placed. I just wanted to hark back to the collar sign and um, the collar sign paper that the original paper that described the collar sign was published in 2017. And in 2020, the authors published a follow up to the collar sign paper just to show the progression of how these aneurysms that displayed a collar sign initially had looked and how placing a second flow diverter had changed the natural history. And what they found was, in fact, that placement of a second flow diverter didn't really change much, honestly. So they were able to, they noted a collar sign in just under 20 of 60 incompletely occluded aneurysms, and the authors elected to treat 10 of those, just under 50%. And actually only one of those aneurysms went on to completely occlude at subsequent angiographic follow-up. So as you can see here on these bottom two panels, the bottom panel in particular, so this is a patient that had two series of subsequent retreatments. So here at uh, 18 months, and then again here at um, 36 months. And as you can see at the four year follow up, there remains persistence of uh, flow within the aneurysm dome and incomplete aneurysm occlusion. By contrast, the aneurysm on the top was able to completely occlude after placing a second pipeline embolization device. Another case I wanted to illustrate just to discuss some of the alternative therapies. This is a case of Dr. Tox, actually. Um, this is a 65-year-old lady who had a incidentally discovered wide neck left PCOM that Dr. Hanel originally placed a flow diverter for um, oops, approximately in 2012. Uh, she underwent treatment with the 4.5 by 14 pipeline in June of 2012 and was maintained on dual antiplatelet therapy for six months with the uh, anatomical features, as you can see here. At a three-year follow-up, she was seen by Dr. Talk in 2015, and incomplete aneurysm occlusion was noted uh, with the presence of a collar sign noted at a three-year angiographic follow-up. So you can see here again this faint collar sign, this faint white line in between the parent vessel and the aneurysm dome. Um, and at that time, Dr. Talk had elected to proceed with an Alcock test to determine if um, the presence of a true fetal PCOM, and the Alcock test did confirm the presence of a true fetal PCOM, in fact. The patient at this time remained asymptomatic. Um, on serial angi angiography, um, subtle increase in aneurysm growth was noted. Um, additionally, due to the presence of the Alcock test confirming the true fetal PCOM, the decision was made that this was not a aneurysm that was gonna be a candidate for second endovascular therapy. And so the decision was made to treat this by a clip reconstruction. And so craniotomy, a terrional craniotomy was performed and using endoscopic assistance, um, two clips were placed to exclude the aneurysm, a fenestrated clip at the proximal neck and then a straight clip at the dome. At four year follow-up after this treatment in 2019, um, treatment occurred in March 2015. Uh, you can see minimal remnant from the um, clip reconstruction and just small hints of an aneurysmal dilatation where the PCOM takes off between the clips. And so microsurgical options for aneurysms that have failed flow diverted therapy is technically comprised several technical difficulties, I would say. Um, this paper that Dr. Talk published is a multi-institutional um, series in conjunction with Dr. Kahn and Baylor and several other authors, including Dr. Lawton and Dr. Morcos at Barra in Miami, that outlined a series of 12 patients where they discussed microsurgical options for aneurysms that have failed flow diverted therapy. And there's several key technical points to consider. One is that the presence of the actual device within the parent vessel makes mobilization during dissection very difficult and turning the vessel using dissection difficult because of the rigidity of the device. And so this is why the endoscope was used and this is how an angled endoscope may aid. The other thing to consider is that during temporary clip placement, the device may be deformed. And if the device 
And if sufficient um, flow or rest isn't maintained, then this can have implications uh, during the procedure for inadequate temporary clip placement. The other thing that Dr. Talk outlined in this paper is the concept of reconstruction versus deconstruction. And so the use of BTO, balloon test occlusion, if parent vessel sacrifice is something that needs to be considered. And so these are the some of the global principles that were discussed for surgical treatment of persisting aneurysms after flow diverter therapy. Um, in this case, the illustrative case here, the first option was chosen with aneurysm clip placement and a clip reconstruction. Some of the options that also may need to be con considered in the arsenal are trapping um, with consideration for a bypass if need be for flow replacement, as well as parent vessel occlusion. And so these two cases highlight um, some of the issues that currently exist regarding retreatment of these aneurysms. So underpinning this is the idea that we really don't know the complete natural history of how these aneurysms behave. What is the rupture risk of these incompletely occluded aneurysms? We know um, how aneurysms behave following coil, endosacular coil delivery, but the idea uh, after flow diverted therapy is that there's less of the aneurysm that's exposed to parent artery inflow as compared to coiling because of the endothelialization that occurs allowing parent vessel reconstruction. The second point is when should these aneurysms be treated? Um, in this case, in both these cases that I illustrated, the patients remained asymptomatic. Um, in one case, the decision was made for conservative therapy. In the second case, due to the presence of aneurysm growth, the um, anatomic location at the PCOM, the decision was made to go ahead and proceed with intervention. And thirdly, what is the best treatment modality? Is endovascular treatment with placement of a third flow diverter the optimal treatment? Is microsurgical treatment optimal? And ultimately, um, as both of these cases highlight, it's patient and anatomy specific. Some of the future directions like I alluded to, um, include really an improved understanding uh, at the natural history of how these aneurysms behave. Um, and then some of the work that I was working on with Dr. Kalmas and Mayor Rochester, which still is continuing, is looking at how to augment these, this endothelialization process. We know that in older patients, the majority of which are the patients that we see harboring these aneurysms, we know that the endothelialization process is diminished and compared to younger patients, perhaps as a function of cell senescence. So how can we augment this endothelialization process? Can it be done via systemically administering um, an agent that may boost endothelial progenitor cells from bone marrow and increase their release? Can it be done by um, delivering intraarterial vasoactive cytokine that may augment the parent vessel smooth muscle and endothelial cell scaffold? Can it be also be done by coding a device as this paper has suggested from prelim basic science research? Can it be done by coding a device with CD31 and endothelial cell progenitor molecule? At any rate, there remain several questions that remain to be answered. And so that's what I hope to continue working on in the next years during my residency at least. So I want to say thank you to Dr. Talk, Dr. Fox, Dr. Miller, Dr. Wen, and Aaron Russell for uh, the cerebrovascular education thus far. Thank you. All yes. right, I see uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Todd right there. You guys want to take it away? Uh, sure, great talk, Krishnan. Uh, great review of flow diversion. <clears throat> balanced uh, about the what's working, what's not working, the failure rate. Uh, like everything, every new technology, basically there is the initial wave and the pendulum. When the pendulum hits, everybody is using it. And then what is the learning? And this is where we are now with the flow diversion. It was a, it's a paradigm shift, definitely. When I was a uh, senior fellow, there was papers coming out as this is a paradigm shift. And yes, indeed, it has changed how we treat aneurysm, especially for the anterior circulation. It has not solved the posterior circulation issues. And I think uh, your, your opinions about, and, and the papers you showed about how to circumvent this problem is, 
is due now basically because we now know which patients not to use it and uh, it's key. Um, the, th the future for this device is to find out when it fails and when not and how to, how to improve this, how to code those devices. Uh, in my early years as well in Buffalo, there was a uh, thought about putting a device with <clears throat> altered uh, porosity. So you maybe you'll have <clears throat> and this is uh, this is hopefully something if you're interested during residency we can look at is the change in porosity where you can put a device where right at the aneurysm neck it has much higher metal coverage and you can individualize it to the specific patient so ahead of time you can see what the aneurysm looks like and what device you think is going to work and use that specific device so moving to very much individualized medicine uh, outstanding talk, and I think uh, I, I really enjoyed it myself. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah, yes, Tristan. Let me let me add to, to what others have have said. It, it was an excellent review. It was very well done, uh, and you sh you should be uh, uh, congratulated for your hard work and your uh, and your your taking the time to thoroughly understand the issues and the problems. There are a couple things I think. Uh, as Dr. Talk mentioned, and you mentioned, this is a paradigm shift. Uh, certainly, this allowed us to treat a whole genre of aneurysms that were uh, very difficult to, to uh, treat technically endovascularly before this. Um, as, as you pointed out, there still are some technical challenges. And I suspect, like so many other things, while the, many of them seem a little bit difficult to overcome, the technology will improve. We've seen certainly some of the cross work with Dr. Q's lab and, and some of the stem cell stuff that's being done here, that there are lots of potentials uh, for uh, exploiting this technology to, to move uh, into other realms to, to, probably in, to perhaps increase the uh, efficacy. Um, and I think the same thing will happen with, with endosacular devices. But I think the other thing that you also pointed out here is that like any other technology, it's not perfect and it doesn't work everywhere. Uh, and I think it reinforces the, uh, the, 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 uh, the concept that you need to have uh, alternatives, uh, including open, uh, uh, procedure, open uh, procedures that can you know, take care of uh, aneurysms that can't be handled endovascularly, uh, uh, highlighting, I think, the wonderful uh, collaborative effort we have here, uh, being able to do both of those things. So, um, uh, yeah, the future is bright for all of this stuff. Um, I think that that more and more, and you know, interestingly, as Dr. Talk reminisces a bit, when I when I came into the field, probably seventy or eighty percent of aneurysms were being taken care of open, and maybe twenty to thirty percent of aneurysms were being uh, taken care of endovascularly. And there were some stubborn holdouts who said, "Ah, this will always be the case, and this is this, this technology is 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 not uh, is not going to be all that helpful." Now, probably seventy to eighty percent of uh, aneurysms are taken care of endovascularly vascularly and maybe 20% open. Uh, it's, you know, technology will continue to improve. Uh, I think you've, you've, you've done a wonderful job in uh, reviewing the field and thank you very much for that. We look forward to, to working with you to develop some more of these things. You obviously have the ideas. Thank you, sir. Beautiful, thank you, David, and thank you, Ravi. I just, the last comment, I'm always surprised as to how, you know, these non-biological Coils were allowed to, they passed, you know, testing to be able to be put directly in the blood vessels, directly touching the aneurysm. When to me, it just makes sense to use biotechnology that is biodegradable, that is cellular therapy, you know, for this, that will allow the dome of this aneurysm to, you know, strengthen so that way they stop growing and all this kind of stuff. And that's what uh, Ravi and, and, and I were working on that and hopefully put a new IP in the next generation of therapies that will be biological rather than just uh, titanium, you know, being placed at the level of the blood vessels, which I've seen some of these cases that my blood can be in, some of the cases that Ravi does in the upper room. I mean, these things are, they work, but they don't work that great. And I think the technologies are available to do new things. So congratulations, for example, for thinking about this. So I think it would be great to your research to think of biological therapies with this type of problems, which are going to continue to be problems, you know. So good, very great talk. I see a lot of comments right here. Well, we come to an end. We went a few minutes over, but it was great. It was a great talk by Krishnan. I just want to make sure that I remind everybody this is Thanksgiving. I see a lot of people. I saw the ATP is also 
giving you some really great uh, comments right there, inspired, and they're watching this in the room right there. So thank you, Krishna. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everybody, and uh, enjoy your week. You know, we are going to be working only mainly Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we have Thursday and Friday. Just remind you, Friday is up for everybody, except, of course, those who are on call. But uh, we are very grateful to the Mayo Clinic for allowing us to have this day. And we're looking forward to the next uh, few weeks' updates. All righty? Adios. <laughs>